Good morning and welcome. What a pleasure it is to greet all of you this morning to God's house in the name of the Lord Jesus. You've chosen well to come to God's house on this very bitter cold winter day to come and enjoy the warmth of the fellowship. We welcome each and every one of you here today. If you're out in the parking lot today, you really need the warmth. We say God bless you and we're grateful that you've come to listen to us on 89.9 FM. And for those of you who will be joining us later on at home on Sunshine TV, we welcome you as well. If you'd like a bulletin for today's service, you know where to get them. If you want one online, go to your phone or your tablet or your computer to our website and hit the button to download the bulletin and it should be provided for you. Also, if you're here in the sanctuary, there are paper copies available on the two music stands in the back of the sanctuary and we invite you to make use of those. Several announcements that we're going to look at that you can find on the back of your bulletin. Um, just be aware that tonight God's people will meet for prayer at 7 p.m. so feel free to come out for that. Tuesday evening there are a number of teams that are meeting supposedly but we'll make sure of that and I will confirm that. I was told that the builders will not be meeting so you can cross that off your list. I do know that the navigators will be meeting and the magnifiers. Navigators at 6, magnifiers at 6.30. Does anyone know, will there be a connectors meeting? There will not be a connectors meeting, so connectors, just be aware of that. If you know of anyone, tell them they have the night off. Wednesday at 12 noon, 12.30, um, please be aware that the community Lenten program will take place on Zoom. We don't have the Zoom information. Check back on our Facebook page, or you can check back on our website, and we'll have the link. What this is going to be is it's going to be area churches, basically the pastors having a brief devotional, one from each week. We have a schedule on our website. Almost forgot, backing up to Tuesday, Ladies Bible Study will be meeting at 10 a.m., so ladies, be aware of that. And then next, uh, and also on Wednesday, now we're back to Wednesday. We're really skipping around this week, aren't we? 7 p.m. is 412 Youth Group in the Fellowship Hall, Adult Bible Study in room number four. You can also catch that on Facebook Live or here on Sunshine TV as well. So I believe those are the announcements that we have. Can't think of any others. Does anybody else know of an announcement? Because they're all so important. If not, we're very pleased this morning to begin our worship service by listening to the prayer.
This morning's call to worship comes to us from Psalm 34, verses 1 through 4. We invite you to give your attention to the reading of God's word. The psalmist writes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he has delivered me from all of my fears. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for this opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray today, Heavenly Father, that we would honor you, that we would bless your name, that we would lift the name of the Lord Jesus above all other names. We ask these blessings in his name. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> Let's sing together number 128. I sing the mighty power of God. moment this morning we'll be sharing Psalm 116 verses 17 and 18 where the psalmist says I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people it is a blessed thing to be generous to one another and to give to the work of God's kingdom and we thank all of you here out in the parking lot and those of you at home who have been so generous in these times and yes even generous to the work of the ministry here 
As you know, if you're here in the sanctuary today or if you happen to be planning to come in, you can put your offerings in the box at the back of the sanctuary. There's also the metal boxes at the two main entrances, upper or lower. Some of you at home have been very clever to mail in checks or to set up your bank account. Thank you for your generosity. So whatever diverse ways that uh, God's people are giving to his work, we're going to take the opportunity now to pray over them and to thank God for his blessings. Will you pray with me now? God, we give you thanks for the generosity of your people. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you model this for us. We know, Heavenly Father, that every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights, and you don't change like shifting shadows. We praise you for that this day. We pray, Lord, that these gifts and tithes and offerings for the many different places and the many means they're getting here these days, that you would multiply them and that you would use them in ways, Heavenly Father, that people would be touched with the gospel message. They grow stronger in their faith as they're fuller discipled in you and that many would be blessed through this ministry and through your kingdom everywhere. We ask all of these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing together number 686, so God of help in ages past. And now it's time for us to go to God in prayer. What a great opportunity this is. So let's bow our hearts and minds before God and let's pray to him fervently and effectually and watch him avail much. Will you pray with me? God, we come before you today praising your name, recognizing, yes, you are God and we are your creation. And Lord, we're so grateful that you are our God. God, we just want to pray today, recognizing your goodness, your majesty, your awesomeness, that you know all things, you see all things, you can do all things, and you get it right all the time. Now, Lord, we freely confess that we don't get it right all the time. Oh, how we fail and how we mess up because of the sin that is in us. 
So, Heavenly Father, we just want to take this opportunity now to say that we are sorry and to come before you to offer our confessions to you. At this time, let us silently acknowledge our sins and confess them to the Lord. God, we thank you so much for your forgiveness, and we claim those words of assurance of pardon from your word, that though our sins be as scarlet, you wash them whiter than snow. What a blessing that is. God, we just want to praise you today for the life that you've given us, for the common graces of the air that we breathe, the water we drink, the food that we can eat, the fellowship that we share, and the company of other people. But Heavenly Father, we just know that um, none of these things would be possible if it were not for your sustaining power and your grace. We thank you for this beautiful world. We thank you, Lord, for your church. We thank you for ways in which we see you at, at work in your world. And, and Lord, we're just amazed in all that you have done and all that you continue to do. And we're really amazed at what we know that you're going to do, that when one day the record is set straight, Lord, we yearn for that day when we're all in your kingdom, when earth and heaven are one, and your dwelling place is our dwelling place for all eternity. But Lord, until we get there, there's much that we have to pray about, and we do that even today. God, we just want to pray for this world that you've created, and for everything, Heavenly Father, that is not according to your design and your will. We pray, Heavenly Father, that through your Holy Spirit working and through your church and the ministry of the Word of God, that there would be changes that we see, that things would happen in your world, Heavenly Father, where many are blessed, but more importantly, where many turn their hearts to honoring you. Lord, on that note today, we think of many who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and Lord, they're on a path that leads to destruction a place called hell. We pray, Heavenly Father, today that as we think and, and remember those individuals that as far as we know who have not settled their peace, who have not made their peace, rather, and have not been settled in their hearts with Jesus as Lord and Savior, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would do a work in their life and draw them to yourself. At this time, let's lift to the Lord the names of people who need Jesus as their Savior and Lord. God, we thank you for the ministry of your church, and we pray for your church everywhere, whether it's here in a time like this, or those that are worshiping in great cathedrals, or mega churches, Lord, or online, or meeting in secret places, Lord, and obscure places in the earth, because it's too dangerous to be public. Lord, bless your church. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would have the faith to believe that even though all that is against us in these times that you have established your church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God, we also want to pray as well for other ways that, that we know that we need to seek your help and your care. We pray for your people, Lord, today who are really wrestling in their faith. Lord, we know that there are people that are tempted to abandon their faith. They're tempted. They think, what does it matter? They see the evil in this world. They think that it doesn't work to be a Christian, but Lord, nothing can be further from the truth. We pray, Lord, that you would just take those scales away, those blinders away, even from believers, Heavenly Father, that may be tempted to listen to these lies. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would take and that your Holy Spirit would draw each one of us all the more closer to you. We pray for those, Father, today who have decisions to make, that you give them wisdom. We pray for those, Father, who perhaps are headed to the hospital or they're dealing with a sickness or aches and pains or upcoming procedures and all of the anxiety that comes with that, Lord, we just pray for your healing hand that ultimately that you would heal and also, Lord, that you would heal hearts and minds and that you would bring your peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we also want to pray for those today who have financial difficulties, for those, Father, who perhaps are having problems with uh, family members or neighbors or co-workers and there's conflict. Lord, we pray we could be people of peace. Lord, there may be things today that are going on and we know there are that we can't even imagine or think of where your people are dealing with difficult times. And Lord, we're just going to ask you to take care of those as well. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you for those who protect us, 
whether they for, uh, guard the borders and the, the coastlands of this nation, the military. Also, Lord, for those that domestically watch over us, we pray for our heroes that are health care workers, EMTs, police, and firefighters. Pray your blessing on them. Lord, we just want to pray now that you would give us wisdom as a church, that as we move forward and as we see the times changing and caseloads and coronavirus doing this or that or whatever, that, Father, we would have the wisdom to do exactly what you would have us to do. May we do your will and nothing else. Lord, may your word today help encourage and mold us and make us into the kinds of people that you would call us to be. And we thank you for the ministry that your word does bring. We ask all of these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you hear about the guy who accused his wife of putting glue on his antique weapons collection? Oh, yeah. He said, she denies doing it, but I'm sticking to my guns. Now, wasn't that the most awful, eye-rolling, cornball, broner joke you ever heard in your life? That was pretty bad, wasn't it? Very, very bad. But do you know where that phrase, I'm sticking to my guns, do you know where that comes from? It's a military term. It was used by those naval officers and those warriors that were on ships. And when the battle would get really hot, those naval officers were told to stick to their guns, stay there, keep on fighting no matter what. That's where that phrase comes from. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems that God's people have always been under attack since the beginning of the world. Yes, we, since the beginning of the church, I was just saying, yes, the beginning of the world. And we could argue that we've had some very nice times in the United States of America where, yeah, people pretty much left us alone for being Christians. But I think that things are starting to heat up, certainly in other parts of the world, and it could be happening here. And so today what we're going to talk about is sticking to our guns. We as believers, no matter how bad things may get, no matter how many people may come after us and aim their guns at us, we need to keep on keeping on. And today's let us statement from the New Testament tells us exactly that. Let us hold true to what we have attained. That particular let us statement comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 16. We're going to look at that passage at this time. In fact, we invite you to open your Bibles, use a pew Bible. If so doing, it can be found on page 1,166 if you're here in the sanctuary. You can call it up on your phone or your tablet or simply listen. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. Before we begin that passage, we'll let you know that Paul is talking about something um, that he is trying to obtain and trying to get. That's a goal that we're going to talk about a little bit later as well. But he starts by talking about trying to obtain this goal. Listen now to what he says in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this, that is, this goal, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only, and here it is, let us hold true to what we have attained. And there's our lesson. So let's talk about Paul's hot pursuit of a heavenly goal. Now, you heard him saying, I'm trying to obtain this goal. What's the goal? You have to back up to verses 10 and 11 to find out what the goal is. So let's listen to that for a minute. Verses 10 and 11, the same apostle Paul, just before he says this, says, that I may know him, that is Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. 
what, what's this goal? Typical Paul talk there, it sounds kind of high and lofty, doesn't it? Well, let's make it more simple. Four parts of this goal, verse 10. First one, he wants to know Christ. Now that word know in the New Testament in this context means to know as in to really, really, really know, to know someone. I don't know about you, but we use that term to know so flippantly. On Friday night, my wife and I were at the Preacher's Eaton Meeting. Yes, there's a bunch of preachers that get together about once a month or thereabout, go to a restaurant somewhere, and we're sitting there having a good time around the table. And I looked to the other end of the restaurant, I saw this guy, and I said, I know that guy. But you know how I know him? I don't even know his name. I've seen him from time to time over here at the Planet Fitness. So do I really know the guy? No, but yet I say, oh, I know that guy. In other ways, is too. Someone might say, oh, yeah, I know that guy. That's Bill. He's the Culligan man. Do you know anything about the guy other than he's the Culligan man? No. Well, do you really know him? We use that term so shallowly and flippantly, and that's not at all what Paul means here. He really wants to know Jesus Christ. That's his goal. Second thing in verse 10, he wants to know the power of Jesus' resurrection. What did he mean by that? I'm going to read you a quote from Kenneth Woost who said, This, what Paul says, means that Paul wants to experience the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, surging through his own being, overcoming sin in his life, and producing the Christian graces. That's what it's about. He wants to know that resurrection power. Third part of the goal, he wants to share in Christ's sufferings. Huh? What do you mean sharing the suffering? Is that really what this says? Yep. Is he nuts? Who wants to suffer? Who wants to become someone and like their death? That's what he says here as well. Who wants to die? Hey, I don't know about you, but I'm a big wimp. When I suffer from something as small as a hangnail that hurts, I head for the Band-Aid box. We will do anything to minimize suffering and pain, right? And yet Paul says he wants to share in the sufferings of Christ and also to understand what it means to become like him in his death. What's that all about? I think what he's referring to is this. Just as Christ suffered and died for the benefit of others, he wants to be able to say that he has done the same thing. It's thinking of the other person. Colossians 1.24, Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings, you Colossians, for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, his church. I think that's the idea. Dying to self, dying to our own agenda, and suffering in some way so that others benefit. Hey, on Thursday, if you were out there shoveling your neighbor's driveway, getting that snow out of there, and by do doing so... Um, you sort of had to die to your own agenda. You know what I mean? You really wanted to be in on the couch, have the TV on, and be eating Twinkies and potato chips or something like that. That's what you wanted to do, but you died to that agenda, and you went over and you helped that guy get cleaned out. That's sort of like the death we're talking about. What about the suffering? Well, now it's Sunday, and you have a sore back. You have sore muscles. You're suffering. But guess what? Even though you're suffering and even though you died to your time on the couch with the chips and the cookies and whatever else, you have done something so that somebody else benefits. That's what Paul is talking about here. He wants to give of himself so that other people come to the kingdom, come to Christ, and are benefited in some way. Third part of the goal. Final part of the goal in verse 11 is to attain the resurrection of the dead. Now, hot diggity dog. That sounds really good, doesn't it? That's the ultimate goal, to be in the presence of God for all eternity in a new and glorified body. No more aches and pains after shoveling snow. And you won't have to shovel snow up there, I'm pretty sure. That's the goal that we're talking about. Those four things. This is his goal. He's hotly pursuing it. He wants to know Christ. He wants to know the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings. And to look forward to that day when he experiences glory. Now, Paul says in verse 12 that he's hotly pursuing this. It's a hot pursuit. I don't know about you, but when I hear the phrase hot pursuit, 
I think of Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane. For those of you who are old enough to remember the Dukes of Hazard show, or if you've seen the reruns of it, man, I think of Roscoe. This is a hot pursuit. That's what we're talking about here. And he says very clearly, he hasn't obtained this goal of verses 10 and 11 yet in verse 12. No, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. He's not morally perfect. He's not there yet. But what does he do? He presses on towards that goal. And this word press on, we understand, is a word that was used in this ancient language for athletes who would be running a race. They would look at that goal line and they would run as fast as they could to pursue that goal. So is it a hot pursuit? You betcha. It's a hot pursuit of a heavenly goal. Now, as we move down to ver verses 13 and 14, we're going to find out some tricks or some tips, if you will, that Paul has. How he hotly pursues this heavenly goal. What does he say in verse 13? Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. It's not my goal yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward towards what is ahead, verse 14, I press on toward the goal. So there's the method, the methodology. You forget what's behind and you strain towards what's ahead. In other words, he's not looking back with any sentimentality, any regrets, or any anything. No, no, no. Always forward towards that heavenly goal. Here's a way to think of this. It came to us from an Our Daily Bread devotional about seven or eight years ago. It was a neat devotional on Our Daily Bread that talked about two famous animals that Australia is known for. One, of course, is the kangaroo, and the other is the emu. Now, in this article, I learned something in that devotional about kangaroos and emus that I didn't know. Hey, I know nothing about kangaroos and emus, to be honest with you. But I can tell you this. They said in this article that one thing that's unique about both of these animals is they very seldom move backwards. They all, it's almost impossible for them to go backwards. First of all, the kangaroo with those big feet and those huge tails... Very difficult for a kangaroo to go back forward. Oh, that's no problem. They'll hop all day long. But it's hard. It's almost impossible for them to go backwards. And what about emus? With their long legs, they can run really fast. But because of something unique in the joints of their knees, it's very difficult for them to move backwards. And so we are told that in Australia's coat of arms, you'll find the kangaroo and the emu there. And the coat of arms for that nation, you know why? It's a symbol that they've made a commitment to always be going forward in progress, not looking back. And that's what Paul is saying. I'm not looking back. Now, if any guy had a reason to be looking back and to be yearning for the good old days, this guy did. Did you ever read earlier in chapter 3 where he goes on and on and on about how good he was, how good he had it, a Hebrew of Hebrews, you know, circumcised on the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin, uh, a Pharisee persecuting the church flawless and all the, or a legalist flawless and all those things. You've read that. Basically, Paul was saying, I, I had it really going for me. But, Philippians 3 8, I count everything back there as loss, as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. It's all garbage to him, that stuff in the past. And someone might say, but, 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 but he, he was a big wig in society. Shouldn't he pine for that? No. Nope. Doesn't matter he was a big wig in society. He's not looking back. But, but wasn't he financially better back in those days? Probably, I guess. But you know what? Didn't matter. He's not looking back. Yeah, but, but, but didn't he have a lot of friends back then that aren't talking to him anymore? It doesn't matter. He's not looking back. It's forward, forward, forward. You press on towards the goal. That's Paul's methodology in that hot pursuit. Now, we talked a lot about Paul. And you might be saying, well, what nugget is in this for me? Well, let's talk about this. There's a memo, at least, for mature Christians in verses 15 and 16. And what's that nugget? Mature Christians... Think the way that Paul is thinking. 
let those of us who are mature, this is what he says, think this way. Make that heavenly goal, we as Christians today, that goal to know Christ, to experience his resurrection power, to share in his sufferings and death, and even, of course, to look forward to that day when we're with him in a new and resurrected body. That should be our goal. And no kidding, we haven't attained that yet. Of course, we know that. In fact, he even mentions that he hadn't attained it. We haven't attained it yet. But we don't want to be looking back. We want to keep on keeping on, pressing forward for that same goal. And by the way, Paul says here very clearly in verse 15 that if anybody doesn't understand this or someone doesn't think this way, God's going to reveal that truth to him. God's going to get a hold of us, and he's going to get us moving in that direction. That's the good thing. So we want to think the way that Paul is thinking. And ultimately, to do that, verse 16, here's the bottom line. Let us hold true to what we have attained. If we can't even keep a hold of where we're at now, how in the world are we going to move forward? We have to hold true. We are told by those scholars that understand the ancient languages, the biblical Greek, that the word here, hold true, it's one word. Hold true is two words in English, but one word in the Greek. It means to walk or to direct your life or to live. How are we to walk or direct our lives? Well, according to what we've already attained. You want an easier way to put it? Stick to your guns. Stick to your guns. You know, the Lord spoke this same message many, many years prior to his people in Jeremiah 6, 16. Let me read to you what he said back then about sticking to your guns. It says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the way is good, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, no, duh, we should stick to our guns. Why did God need to inspire Jeremiah to tell the people that? Shouldn't the people of God know they need to stick to their guns? Well, apparently they needed a reminder, a big reminder, because at verse 16, at the end, I didn't read that, it says, but they said, we will not walk in it. They didn't want to stick to their guns. And I really, really hate to tell you this bad news, but I'm going to do it anyway. There are a lot of people in the church today, in the United States of America and other parts of the world, mainly the Western world, who are not sticking to their guns. And they need a not-so-subtle El Cabong reminder, I think, hey, let us hold true to what we have attained. you got to stick to your guns. What am I talking about? Some of you may remember a long time ago, I don't expect many of you to remember this, but I talked about a phenomenon about five years ago called the rise of the nuns. Now, some of you might be thinking, are you kidding me? That sounds like a low-budget B-movie about a bunch of elderly Catholic women in a convent that somehow turned into superheroes. That's not the rise of the nuns. We're not talking about nuns as in N-U-N-S. We're talking about nuns as in N-O-N-E-S. They have no zero zilch religious affiliation so when it comes to some sort of faith they have none and the rise of the nuns that's not the title of a movie it's the title of a book this is an actual phenomenon of people who said that's it we're done we're done with church no it's not that they were done with one particular church because they were moving to Atlanta Georgia and they find another church or something like that nor was it even people that were ticked off in their church and went down the street, found a church they were happier at. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about people that are truly done. The nuns are done. Don't want anything to do with the church. Done. Now, let me tell you about a place where we're seeing this happening. 
one particular area, one community, there's this place that I could share with you where, let me give you the statistics. First of all, 32% of the people in this area do claim to be Christians as in Protestant, either mainline or evangelical Christians, 32%. Another 15% claim to be Catholic and 1% claim to be Eastern Orthodox. If you're adding up the numbers now, you have 48% of the people that at least claim, now whether they're true Christians or not, that's between them and God, but they claim some sort of Christian affiliation, 48%. In this same area, another 5% claim some other religious affiliation, maybe Hindu, Muslim, or Buddhist, or something like that. So if you do the math, what that means is you have 48% claim to be Christian, another 5% uh, claim some other religion, so there's 47% left. Guess what they are? They're the nuns, 47%. No religious affiliation whatsoever, let alone they're certainly not connected to Jesus Christ. And you might be thinking, yep, heard of places like that. That sounds like England or maybe Scandinavian Europe or maybe California out there where they grow a lot of nuts. That wasn't nice, was it? But no, this isn't California. This isn't Scandinavia. This isn't England. You know where this place is? This place that I just mentioned, where 47% of the population have no connection to any faith, let alone to Jesus Christ, is Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. Right here. Let me give you some more facts that are kind of scary. Did you know that about two-thirds of young people age 18 to 29, when they grow up, they become adults, they leave the church, they become nuns. That's what they're telling a research group that keeps a pulse on this called the Barna Research Group. And you know, this pandemic isn't helping things either. With churches being closed for given lengths of time, we were closed for a while, some churches are still closed, that there is a prediction, according to experts, that more people are going to leave the church because they're just not coming back to church. Now for a time out, we're talking about people that are totally gone. We're not talking about people that are leery of coming into the church building now because of the virus. If you're out in the parking lot listening in 89.9 FM, believe me, you're not a nun. In fact, you're very dedicated if you're willing to be out there in the cold. Same with those of you that are watching us on Sunshine TV. You're watching us faithfully, and we know that you can't wait to be back here. You're not a nun either. But we're talking about those that because they got out of the habit they're done they're done it's going to be very hard to get them back david kinema of the barna research group said this quote i actually think we're going to see an increasing number of people who have lost connectedness with their faith community with their usual rhythms and practices and that's why this is something that i think god is telling me that we really want, I really want to look into. Right now, I believe God's telling we're looking in ways that perhaps we can restart our bulletin ministry. Remember the days if you missed, either got a bulletin or an email, we've not been doing that because we didn't want to insult people, say, hey, we missed you Sunday. Well, I was out in the parking lot, I watched it at home. There's gotta be a better way we can connect with people. Maybe we need to look at new ways of discipleship. Don't get me wrong, our navigators team is doing an awesome job with that but maybe there's some new things we can do to help people to grow in their faith. Certainly, I want to keep pushing, coming out Sunday night and praying for the revival of God's church. People say, what happens at those Sunday night prayer meetings? That's what we pray for. Pray for a lot of things, but especially that God will pour out his spirit on his church and raise up people to be passionate followers of him. That's what we're praying for. This is a battle worth fighting for. I guarantee it. But what can we all do? I think follow the example of the Apostle Paul. Same heavenly goal that Paul has, we need to have that as well. Find that goal to be more like Christ, to share in his sufferings, to know him, to look forward to that day when we're in his presence forever and ever, and hotly pursue that goal. Let's keep sticking to our guns. And by all means, let us hold true 
to what we have obtained. Amen and amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, number 527, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And we invite you now to receive the benediction. Let's pray now. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you that came out to the sanctuary today, thank you for being with us. And for those of you, again, that braved the cold and listened on 89.9 FM, we're pleased to have you. And for those of you that joined us at home on Sunshine TV, thank you for being with us today. This concludes this morning's early worship service.